The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. Welcome to Compass, I'm Les Heen. This week we'll look at some changes in agriculture and the environment. There are always innovative ideas in agriculture, and over the past year we've visited farms in western Minnesota to look at a few. One of those ideas we looked at is called subsurface irrigation. Instead of the traditional above ground irrigation systems that are common in most areas, this type of system installs pipes in the ground to water crops. We visited with Brian Valdi of Yellow Medicine County about his subsurface irrigation system. Well, a couple of years ago, we checked into both overhead irrigation with a center pivot and then um, ran into this vendor down in Sioux Falls that was selling subsurface irrigation. And that kind of intrigued me a little bit because subsurface irrigation is when you plow in drip tape below the corn ruts and you have the ability to not only irrigate but also add nutrients as well, fertigation. So, you know, we met with both options, both the center pivot and the drip tape, and put together proposals on what the cost would be. And just thinking long-term wise, efficiency wise, that we went the route with subsurface irrigation, even though no one in Minnesota has really adapted this practice yet, but we thought we'd give it a shot. Just, um, you know, visiting with people with overhead irrigation, you, you hear of the benefits of the yield increase, but also you hear about the issues with replacing gearboxes and end guns. and you know the maintenance that's involved with that and when you look at the subsurface irrigation you know really there isn't a lot of maintenance that's involved with that once everything's working properly um, you know not having to move a pivot when you plant the field when you work the field when you spray the field when you <laughs> harvest the field you know just not having any obstacles in the way and and you know if, it seems like every summer the wind blows and you know, if you get a 50 mile per hour wind, we don't have to worry about a irrigation system tipping over on us. So everything's underneath the soil. The biggest challenge is, you know, when it's plowed in 14 inches deep, you know, obviously you don't want to hit it with any tillage tool. So that's, that would be the obstacle, but our tillage depth is substantially less than 14 inches. So hopefully that won't be an obstacle, but you know, just efficiency wise, when you, when you can pump the water in the ground, in the corn ruts, you don't have any evaporation. So for efficiency-wise, you're basically 100% efficient. The water you pump is the water that gets utilized by the corn plant, and also the ability to fertigate with that. That when you're when you're pumping water into the corn ruts, that nutrients, water, and nutrients is taken up through the corn ruts. Well, if we can pump water and add nutrients right in the corn ruts, you know, I I feel there's going to be a bushel increase to be gained with that approach as well. So. So yeah, it's kind of an experiment. We're gonna see how subsurface irrigation works in Minnesota. Also during the past year, we looked at the return of hemp production. Hemp was once widely grown in Minnesota for rope products, and has been the subject of some discussion due to the fact that hemp is being equated to marijuana, although hemp does not provide the intoxicating aspects of marijuana. However, there are examples of hemp's introduction for other uses. With now there are more than 1,200 acres of hemp production in Minnesota, and this is an experimental stage, but may yield an alternative crop. We talked with John Strophus, who's the owner of Minnesota Hemp Farms near Hastings, and he shared with us the potential of hemp to give farmers and consumers some options. It gives farmers an alternative uh, profitable crop uh, to corn and bean uh, production, which of course in Minnesota is one of our, our two top uh, crops grown in the state. So this is um, a crop that can be rotated in also in an organic system for farms that are interested in converting to organic. It's a good crop to provide uh, weed pressure in a new organic system. We've got some farms that are in western Minnesota. There's some farms uh, south by Rochester, uh, Jackson, Lamberton area, also in the southern region. Then we're here in the Twin Cities area. 
and then we have um, in the Alexandria St. Cloud area and then all the way up to uh, East Grand Forks and Erskine, Minnesota. Uh, we've got growers that far as well. And actually one of our largest growers um, is in the Erskine area with 390 acres of organic ground. Farmers are also working on renewable energy. While wind farms have been with us for some time, on-farm solar energy is growing in popularity. Josh and Cindy Vanderpaul operate Pastures of Plenty in Chippewa County. At the core of their operation is a management model which considers the environment as well as the family and community. And they balance these factors and also look for some long-term profitability in their livestock business. We spoke with the Vanderpoles to learn about their decision to lower energy costs by installing solar panels on the farm. I think one thing that we had looked at was actually that we sell our meat to co-op stores down in the Twin Cities. And we saw that that was kind of an important thing to have something different or unique, you know, in how we collect our energy or our power, you know, instead of just collecting it from the general electrical company. Um, we saw that that was an opportunity for our customers to see that we were trying to do something different. And a lot of our co-op stores are also doing the same thing. Some of them also have solar panels on top of their buildings. And so we thought it would be a good thing to do. It pays basically for our two walk-in freezers to run. You know, so like this whole summer, our electrical bill has been basically zero. And so that's kind of a nice thing when you consider you have two big walk-in freezers that you're trying to put electricity into, and now it's being paid for by what we get every day off the sun and so. And the power matches pretty well with the solar. To our usage, uh, hot out, the freezers run harder and use more power and the solar then makes more power where sometimes it's hot out and the wind isn't blowing. The Vanderpoles market much of their products to Twin Cities area restaurants and grocers. No matter what type of farm production is involved, farmers continue to display leadership in a role to treat their respect to the land as well as look at the byproducts of each farming operation. And here to talk about some new systems to encourage on-farm recycling, we have Brita Saylor. Brita is Executive Director of the Recycling Association of Minnesota. And also with us is Price Murphy and he's with the Madison, Wisconsin-based company Revolution Plastics. And I know that they have operations in many other states as well. So Brita, Price, welcome to Compass. Thank you for having yes, us. Thank you so much for having us. There's been a lot of attention in the last year, I know, I've been reading about on-farm recycling. And, and Brita, I'd like to start with you. What, what exactly does this, what is this campaign about? Well, this campaign is about starting recycling for farmers. And what this allows them to do is basically to not burn. You know, we know that there was a lot of that. So there's not burning, not hauling to landfills. But this is the first opportunity. We in Minnesota have tried a number of times. The Department of Agriculture has tried, the PCA, and and this time the Recycling Association was trying to make this happen. And the on-farm recycling is all due to Revolution Plastics because none of the other um, avenues that we explored were able to do that largely because of transportation issues. You know, transportation is always at the bottom of so many things. Sure. So yeah, it was bringing it in a way that was convenient for farmers so that if they would have a container placed on their farm, that they could then put their egg pla agricultural plastics into, that would make it easier for them to accomplish that. And so then we worked in the transportation, and I think we'll talk a lot more about some of that with Price, with, about the uh, Revolution plastic. Sure. Yeah, so. so. Price, I know we always have to start somewhere with recycling, so tell us what sort of plastics you're involved in recycling with Revolution Plastics. Well, the team at Revolution Plastics really believes in preserving our farmlands and supporting our farmers. So we focus very heavily on silage bags, bunker covers, bell wrap, grain bags, greenhouse film, and boat wrap. Those are the ones that we understood were the biggest uh, problem for the Minnesota farms and businesses. So that's where we, we started. So those are the ones we focus on now. And, if, and for people who are not familiar perhaps with farm production methods, if they're driving down the road and they see you know, big round bales at the side of the road and there's white plastic on the bales or they drive by a dairy farm and they see you know, whole piles where there's maybe old tires stuck up on top of the pile and plastic under it, that's what we're talking about, right? Yes, sir. That's what we're talking about. And so for farmers, what do they have to do with those kind of things before they would, they would recycle? Because, I mean, this can be a lot of plastic in a year, right? 
Yeah, so farmers use thousands of pounds of plastic to keep their feed fresh, to feed the cows so they can milk and things of that nature. Uh, what they were doing previous to the recycling program was they were either having it hauled to the landfill, paying a, a large fee for that. Uh, some were uh, having to bury it on the farm because they had no outlet for it, and some were uh, burning it on the farm. So now we have a solution for them where they don't have to do those things. And this ends up being concentrated, I suppose, in the areas where we're talking about livestock products. In the parts of Minnesota, a heavier concentration where we have heavier concentrations of cattle, right? Absolutely. So the heavier concentration of dairies is going to be the heavier concentration of plastic use. And that's where we focus on is trying to help those. Sure. I understand. And uh, Brita, I just want to mention one of the things that we did bring along, we brought along some props today. We've got this banner behind us because this is part of a larger campaign that you've been working on to, to raise awareness. And I suppose part of what you're hearing from farmers on this is that kind of what Price is talking about. Now we have a way to sort of deal with all of this stuff that, that ends up being generated. Right. And I think that was really driven home to me and I think to others. We sort of knew that there was burning going on or burying, but it is really true that some farmers could not even get a waste hauler to come to their farm. I mean, they truly did not have a, an option. Others did have some options, but we, we kind of wanted to start fresh and say we're going to move ahead on this and not look at you know what was done before. So now we are able to do the recycling by putting the dumpsters, um, if the farm is large enough to qualify, they put the dumpsters on the farm, and then also they started a new project with recapture bags, which we can talk about a little bit later. Mm -hmm. But it, it was getting an option in front of these farmers, and it's not just dairy, but also the beef, and of course greenhouses, so it's true when you do drive by, as we did on our way today. Yes, we did. I saw. I, yeah. I, I'm always looking for those. I wonder if those are one of the farms. And uh, so um, those, big, those big, big bunkers with the tires are certainly um, the type of plastic. I guess maybe I'll also mention at this point that there are, I, we also saw a number of bales that were wrapped in, in a netting. That type of plastic is more of a nylon based and it is not something that can go in Correct. with with what um, Price's company, what, what Revolution collects because it's just the wrong thing. I, I use the um, little, I guess, explanation of saying it's sort of like putting bad milk in the milk tank. It spoils all of it. So if, if that material is in the dumpster and it goes down to their main plant in Little Rock, Arkansas, it ruins a big batch. And I know, and Price, I think one of the problems, I suppose, that comes up with this kind of plastic is, you know, when, you, when this plastic would come to your company, it's not as if this plastic is beautiful and pristine, and it's not as if the sort of people take a little plastic milk jug and rinse it and it's, it looks almost perfect. You've got to deal with plastics that have been through a lot before they get to you. How do you handle that? You know, it's tough. Uh, some of the ag plastics we handle are some of the dirtiest you're going to find. Uh, they, they've stored feed for a year, there's feed stuck to the bag, they've drug it through the mud. And what we ask farms is pick that up and shake it out to the best of your ability before you put it in a dumpster. You know, a little dirt or mud doesn't bother us, but, but try to leave as much on the farm as humanly possible. Uh, this year alone, in excess dirt and mud, we've collected over a million pounds that should have stayed on the farm. Uh, and we're working with farms to educate them to shake that out a little better. We're going to help you with the plastic, but leave that soil on the farm for growing crops and things of that nature. And your company is able to do this because what you do is, you know, you got these dumpsters, they're on the farms, the material goes in, and then you guys come along and pick up the plastic. What happens to it after that? What is it, what, what's the end market for that? Absolutely. So we operate our own collection fleet. Uh, we operate our own factories. So uh, we, the chain of custody stays with us the entire time. So the farmer places the uh, plastic in the dumpster. We ask that they stuff it in very tight, get over a thousand pounds in that dumpster. Give us a call. We'll come out within seven to 10 business days. We'll tip that dumpster. We're gonna bring it back to uh, our facility. We're gonna bale it up in tight, dense bales. We're gonna truck it down to Arkansas. And that's when it goes into our uh, recycling factory in Stuttgart. We've been recycling down there since 1996. We've recycled over 1 billion pounds of plastic through that factory. We're very proud of that. And we've got a patented proprietary wash system that we put that plastic through to get it nice and clean so we can use it in other products. So other products, what are some examples of the products that, that would be made at the end? So some of the product lines that we manufacture at our, uh, one of our several plants, we've got uh, irrigation tubing, we have trash bags, construction film, uh, carry out bags for restaurants. We have a wide variety of uh, different uh, end products that we can use this material for. 
Yeah. Brito, it struck me when I was thinking about those farms that you drive by and you see all the plastic. One of the questions that comes up, and you touched on a little bit, Price, is, well, why is all this plastic there in the first place? I mean, you know, because people who don't know about farming, they might say, well, if it's reduced, reuse, and recycle, why, why is there so much plastic? But there's an important reason why that plastic's there in the first place. There is, and that's a great question. I'm so glad you asked because, you know, we used to farm and, and put putting our silage in silos. And silos have a long history of being a confined space and there are safety issues for those farmers. And that's something that has just kind of been part of silo, working with silos. But um, the other thing is that when you when you chop the food, whether it's baleage or haylage or you know the silage, and you put it in the bags in, under this kind of plastic, that um, actually makes it much more nutritional for the cows. There's not so much mold and spoilage, so the the work that the farmer goes to to collect, you know, to make the hay, um, is actually he, they don't see the spoilage, and so. You know, it's, it's one of those things with plastic, whether it's on the farm or someplace else, there are good things about it. And there are things that, you know, we use in our society all the time. And the fact of, you know, being able to save some lives through not having the silage, pro the problems in silos is really a big deal. So it's, it's not just arbitrary that farmers are using this plastic, but, and it has been a big problem as to how to deal with it. And all of our, the, the folks I work with in the recycling, um, at the landfills and at what we call MRFs, which is Materials Recovery Facilities, which is where the recyclables go. When these big long ropes of agricultural plastic get into their facilities, it causes all kinds of trouble because none of the equipment they have is designed to deal with those. It, it just gums up the works that's they have to stop working. And even landfill, you know, you think, well, the landfill folks have the big caterpillar, they can do whatever. But it's tough. So um, not only is it helping out the farmers, the cows, it's helping out our solid waste recycling facilities all along the way. And it's you know recapturing these bags and actually turning them into something that's useful. So yeah. I know since you, you brought along some props, so let's take I a look at the props. Tell, tell us what you brought here. OK. First of all, I'll start out with these lovely little samples. This is the shred. I'm just going to hold this right up here in, absolutely. Front, of, in front of Price because I know we got the camera framed this way. So tell Ab us what this is. Absolutely. That is the shredded plastic. And maybe I should have Price tell because he works with that at their plant. I'd be, I'd be glad to. So once we take that dirty plastic into that factory and we wash it, this is after it comes out of the wash and the shred process. Mm -hmm. So now we've removed all the dirt, all the contaminants, and now it's shredded into fine flakes here. And then we will uh, then take it and extrude it into post-consumer resin. So now this resin is ready for use at any of the factories to make the construction film, the uh, irrigation tubing, uh, a number of different items can be made. So these are just steps in the process of the uh, recycling of ag plastics. So you break it down to smaller and smaller pieces and then you can reuse it. Yes, recycle sir. it, I mean, you, you, they melt it down, yeah, sure. the melt piece. And this is pretty standard in the recycling issue, uh, industry to see these little pellets. They're sometimes a little bit different sure. shape, but. It's amazing how many places, businesses in Minnesota, southern Minnesota all across, actually um, use, if not these, others um, in their processes. More than one would think. It's great. <laughs> you also brought some bags along as well, I see. And this is just to show, you know, people think, well, they only make garbage bags, big old black garbage bags, but not the case. These nice, beautiful little blue ones, they make them in many different um, thicknesses so that these are the same, yeah, they're actually even better than some of the ones that are um, made from other plastics because agricultural plastic has to be very, very good. It's the highest quality. So boat wrap and the covers that they use at nurseries and of course the farm plastic we were talking about is very high quality and it's very valuable because you can make great bags and the other things that Price was talking about out of them. And uh, this one actually is for the Slim Jims, for anyone that might happen to <laughs> be in the custodial world, um, you know, that fits. But just to show you also that because Revolution is very picky, as we say, they, they have to be picky to turn out a good product. And, you know, that's something that the Recycling Association is not only interested in getting the actual collection on the farms, that's very important to us to start the recycling, 
But, and we never have to tell farmers about this, but if you don't have a market for something, you're not going to be able to collect it very much or grow it. So we are also working with the company on marketing the material because the, when, let's just say a school in you know, western Minnesota or in Stearns County decided to buy these bags, mm -hmm. they would be helping to solve the problem that many of their students' parents have. You know, it's yeah. just, and the counties are now starting to do this, as, to use it as well. In fact, we were able to get it on the state contract, which is a big deal, yeah. because now all the local government folks can buy it at a reduced rate. And I just think it's, it's not very often that we run into a situation like this, where we can actually have everybody in the state helping to solve a state issue or you know problem with in the environment, and it, they they can all help by buying these. And I don't work for Revolution. I don't. <laughs> I know it sounds like it, but I just I, I work hard on markets, and sure. that's an important piece of recycling. So we like to see that and and have people understand that by buying those, even if you live in the metro, you can be helping with um, this agricultural problem. Well, and Bryce, I expect one of the things, as Brita touched on here, is that the, the world of plastics is, is huge, and there are many, many varieties of plastics. So in order to be successful in the remanufacturing, you have to have it narrowed down to a certain type of plastic that's, that's coming into the stream in the first place, right? A absolutely. Uh, Revolution Plastics focuses heavily on the uh, low-density polyethylene films which is your agricultural plastics. Uh, that's what we focus on heavily in manufacturing and collection. So, you know, it, a lot of people call us and ask us about milk jugs and uh, things of that nature. And, you know, we collect over 200 million pounds of agricultural films nationwide every year. So we found it best to, to stick to our niche and uh, really be very good at it and focus on it. But yes, sir, you're absolutely right. Uh, there's a lot of different plastics out there that are not all created equally. Yeah, and I expect, you know, most people are not going necessarily going to have the experience of going up to a silage bunker, let's say, or a bale, right. and grab that handful of plastic. But if you do that and compare it to what's in a milk jug, it's pretty easy to tell these are dramatically different projects. And one of them is, you know, those, those, those silage bags, they're huge and, and they're tough. Mm -hmm. It's a very different product. Absolutely. We spend a lot of time on education. Uh, we partner with the, the different counties and, and agricultural agents in each county as well to try to help us educate the farms on, on what to put in the dumpsters, what we can help them with, and uh, uh, what they can do with some of those other items. But uh, we definitely, there's differentiation. Yeah. Breed, I'm curious, since this started, how are you starting to measure the success? I mean, are you able to quantify where this is going and where you started and where you are now compared to where you want to be? Because it, yes. it, it's, it's, yes. it's obviously a very big effort. It's a big effort. Well, we, we started at almost zero, really, truly. Um, there was, we had done a little bit of recycling of plastic, 40,000 pounds. And, and we were thrilled with that because that was 40,000 pounds more than we had before. But Absolutely. right it's a drop in the bucket compared to what we are able to collect now through the Revolution program. But anyway, we started at zero. So, and when we began the project, we didn't know, although I knew about Revolution Plastic, I was able to have met with them in the past and had conversations, sure. but we didn't know if we would be able, if they would be able to come to Minnesota. So it was sure. fortunate that happened. Now we have had the collections on farm. Um, there are two hubs. One is actually just over, we call it the Winona hub, but it's just over the border in Wisconsin. Sure. But, and then the other one in uh, Sox Center. But it's about, it, it, the number keeps going up, so Price may can correct me, but it's about seven million pounds that have been collected just in a year and a half, really, a little over a year and a half from the farmers and that's a huge amount that's all stuff that was going to landfills or other places and so we went from zero to, <laughs> <laughs> to seven million pounds and that that's a great thing and also with uh, the bailey nurseries as well they had a, a yeah. large collection well, sure because you get nursery plastic as well so, right. so so let's talk about the farmers reaction i mean you've been doing this now oh. for over a year so i'll start with you price what are you hearing from farmers who are now have a place to put the plastic? Uh, the reaction has been predominantly positive. Uh, we've got uh, all the right equipment. We've got a great team. Uh, we have the infrastructure to collect over 40 million pounds in the Midwest without breaking much of a sweat with less. Uh, so uh, we've been uh, very helpful to the farms. They've been very helpful to us providing feedback and, and continue to 
refined processes to make it easier on them, to make it more cost effective for us. But uh, all the uh, feedback has been predominantly positive. Brita, what are you hearing? Same thing, farmers are happy. I mean, they're, they're saving money on their disposal costs. And many farmers really, truly didn't want to be landfilling. And, the, and it wasn't just about money. And you know, they, they wanted to do the right thing, but there wasn't a right thing available to them. But I, I do also want to say how much our partners have helped. This has been such a, a partnership project. And um, Minnesota Milk, for instance, has done a lot of work in getting the word out. All of the milk, you know, first district, I drove right past them on my way here. In, and, in Litchfield on yes, Highway 12. Yes, in Litchfield, yep. And so all of those dairy associations and the creameries have also helped by telling their members about this program and saying, you know, call Revolution, find out the details. So, um, and we had help from Department of Agriculture, help from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, um, and many other businesses, you know, that are involved in the dairy and the beef organizations. And I, I have to say that I've been able to go to their annual conferences. And now after two years of being at the Cattlemen's Association or the Minnesota Milk Expo, Dairy Expo, I will get repeat customers that come back. You know, these are the people that I said, hey, <laughs> you know, last year. And this year they're saying, hey, to me, um, because they're, they're really pleased that they're now able to um, take care of this material, you know, in a responsible sure. way. And I sure. will always like to say it's environmentally and economically sustainable. Because yeah. sure. if you don't have yeah. the economic, it, it doesn't stay put. Okay. We only have about a minute or so left, so I'd just like to, to close this out by letting folks know if they want more information about plastic recycling, if you're interested, where should they go? Brita? Well, if they're interested in doing agricultural plastic, what they ne need to do is actually call Revolution. Uh, we refer them directly to Revolution. They have a team in place that takes the phone calls, kind of determines whether that farm is going to you know, qualify or not. So we have them call Price's number right here. <laughs> and okay. um, on the postcards and um, and then also if they have other questions about you know things like twine which does not go in these containers um, sure. there are some other other issues they can call the Recycling Association of Minnesota. Recycling Association of Minnesota. Bryce? Yes sir anybody that like to uh, participate and the thing is everybody can participate in some fashion so there are farms that will have eight yard dumpsters there's farms that don't want dumpsters, they just pile it on the ground. We call that a stockpile. We still help those guys. And we also have what's called the recapture bag. So you got the small farms that, you know, it take them a year to two years to fill a dumpster. So uh, we've got recapture bags available at Blue Lake Plastics and Salk Center. Uh, they can go purchase a roll. It's five bags to a roll. They can stuff their ag plastics in that. They give us a call and our trucks will roll right to the farm and, and pick them up. So there's really no excuse for any farm in Minnesota that wants to recycle their ag plastics to not be doing so at this time. Right. Okay. There's 30 counties that do on farm either the bags or the dumpsters and the remaining 57 all qualify if they ha can make weight, so okay. to speak. And Good to know where they can go. So, Brita Saylor, Recycling Association of Minnesota and Price Murphy of Revolution Plastics, thanks for joining us on Compass. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. That's all we have for this week on Compass. See you next week.